Ladies and gentlemen, we've reached that time once again in which we will have our live strategy meeting. This is where some of our trading team gets together and discusses some of the themes and dynamics that might come to play for the month and with earnings season on the horizon this is a great time to do a little prep in advance of that so I'm going to welcome in blue chip trader event trader scalp trader and chart trader and I'm gonna lead off with chart because I love to get the macro dynamic rolling and considering that we just had a big testimony with Congress with um, Fed Chair Powell and we're coming off the heels of some new updates from the various ECBs. What's your overall takeaway as far as assessing the market right now, Brett? Um, well, like I said this morning pre-market and like uh, we've talked about several times this week and last week, it's kind of the same situation, a really odd situation of uh, extremely uh, underexposed retail and professional money managers in a market that I think effectively boils down to kind of have your cake and eat it too, where economic data is actually not faltering as much as it looked like it was a month ago from, from some of the data points we've seen more recently, and yet the Fed is still committed to cutting interest rates. So it's a, I think it's kind of a perfect storm for a continued breakout to the upside because I don't really see who's there to provide selling pressure, even under conditions where, you know, we'd get some bad news. But I think that the, the I mean, I, I guess overall, I do look for a bit of a stall during the first couple of weeks of earnings season, because I think that there's an anticipation of companies uh, uh, being opportunistic with the ability to sandbag guidance for the rest of the year based on scapegoating uh, some of the uncertainty around trade. And I think that that offers them an easy chance to outperform for the rest of the year. Um, and I think they'll take advantage of it. And I think people who are sitting on the sidelines and looking for a way back into the market maybe will wait until after they see some of that track laid down in, in terms of the, the, the chorus of this earnings season. And then I think that once you get past that, I mean, you're, you're talking about in August where – We've already got that in the market. We've got a situation where the Fed is in an easing cycle. Data is really not that bad. And everybody has, has just piled into bonds for the last six months. So if we're looking ahead at a possible second rate cut coming in September, and we've already sandbagged the guidance, I think that you'd need very strong and very definite signs of an economic downturn accelerating at that point to keep the market from really taking off to the upside. So that's where I'm at right now. And it also seems as though if they were to sandbag guidance, I mean the collective group of companies, that actually adds to some of the fuel that could get the Fed on board to say, hey, well, you know, we're, we're seeing uh, some minor slowdowns or we're seeing some cautious outlooks out there, so therefore it's another feather in the cap to keep rates low, right? Yeah, sure. And and I think that any of that kind of talk, again, because there's not a lot of uh, overripe fruit hanging on the tree, um, even when you do that, I think that what you'll see and what would be more confirmation of this view, and I, I really like to set things up that way. I like to have a bias where I can see exactly what, you know, where I understand in advance what sorts of dynamics I should see to understand that I should be increasing in my conviction. And I think one of those sorts of things is seeing – if, if we do see some of that, um, some of that talk from companies and maybe even some of that talk from Fed speakers over the next, say, three to five weeks, um, and the market tries to pull back on it and really can't get any momentum going on the downside, that I think would be strong confirmation. Because then you're lowering expectations ahead of another cut, and if you don't see a significant deterioration, and just you know, straight up macro econ data, if you don't see that, then you've lowered expectations, you're coming into another cut, you're already past earnings season, and, and you've lowered the bar for, for companies to leap over it in Q3. And it just seems like it sets up a situation where everybody who's been sitting on the sidelines, and we just keep seeing more of this fund flows data, where just there's so much dry powder on the sidelines at this point. People have just been so cautious about exposure. And again, that's, that's both in, and Gavin and I covered this on Monday, that's both from retail and pro from professional money managers together. And at some point, if this starts to then lower expectations and leak back to the upside, I think there is this 
scramble for exposure that, that starts to become pretty profoundly set up. And I, I'm not, not really sure where the hole is in that argument. I'm, I'm more than willing to shift from that bias if I see things that don't confirm it. But it seems like that's going to be the path of least resistance. And I guess the question I have in my mind is more about, you know, do we see the pause for earnings season? Do we see the pause for sandbagging guidance? Um, if we don't, if we just see better than expected results right now, then the, it gets tough to chase, but I think you have to. Mike, let me make sure I'm understanding what you're saying uh, correctly. Okay. So the fact – where you see the overall risk is if we have a definite downturn in the economy. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Now, doesn't that add to the Fed's position of they would then continue easing? I would almost think that – a recovery or however you want to say it really good economic data may be the actual risk here um, I, so I, I think that it's possible you could look at it that way too but I think that what I'm talking about is moving into recessionary conditions there's no way that this market breaks out higher even if the Fed cuts to zero in its next meeting if we're breaking into recessionary conditions that's not how things work if we're heading into recessionary conditions you will see another tranche of people who own this market who are completely strong hands now and have no plans to sell suddenly be on the offer big because you're going to go through a process. You've got too much leveraged debt. You've got too many corporations that are too over leveraged so that if we start to see a significant deterioration, credit's going to tighten even no matter what the Fed does. And it's just going to lead to this shock on the downside. And, you know, we've just built up too much uh, too much leverage on the corporate side, I think, to, to avoid that. But if we, I mean, the, 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 the bubble situation, the bubble uh, uh, scenario would be sort of just kind of about the type of data we've been seeing. Nothing spectacular to the upside, nothing that looks like we're starting to spiral to the downside. Just kind of holding steady with the sort of thing we've seen for the last, most of this year. I think that that would be something that leaves the Fed in a situation where it can keep cutting because it's got to get serious about getting to 2% inflation on some level, and it does not want to entrench expectations of 1.5 or 1.2% inflation. That's what Japan did. You start to let those things get digested by the average economic agent in the system, and it just it, it, it means you're always going to have less wiggle room to try to manage the cycle, and you're going to end up in a, a Japan kind of state of conditions and I think the Fed is is that's what we're scared of right now we're just not scared of inflation so I think they're gonna wanna let it run hot they're gonna wanna get back to two percent and if it looks like we're just gonna sit here in the type of economy we've seen now even if you continue to see unemployment at all-time lows even if the stock market is breaking out to all-time highs I think they would in that scenario probably continue to cut to try to foster some kind of bump up in inflationary expectations to avoid it just continually deteriorating down to 1.2 or, you know, 1% in terms of long-term inflation expectations. So I think that if you just, if, if, you're right, if you see a, an explosive kind of shift in, in economic activity, I mean, obviously that's going to ramp up earnings expectations and also going to probably cause money to come in. But if the Fed is forced to react sharply to go back into a hiking situation, then yeah, that could have some limiting uh, 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 dynamic. But I think that if you really see a deterioration, and the type of deterioration that has the chance to spiral in terms of economic activity, business investment, business spending is what's really been weak. Consumers haven't. But if it starts to spread to the consumer, then you're going to get some kind of corporate deleveraging. And that means they're going to start firing people. And that means that they're going to start cutting back on, on all sorts of things. And that's just something that, you know, we would be going through a contractionary the other side of the mountain. And if we start, we, we're not there right now. And I don't think it matters what the Fed does in reaction initially. The, the Fed can't really uh, stall that process once it gets traction. So I think that that's the real risk to the downside here is that some of the stuff we've been seeing built into the yield curve actually turns out to be the scenario that, you know, it's been indicating the last eight times we saw that. And um, and you're just, you're not going to continue to get a breakout to the upside in the stock market in under conditions where we really start to spiral into a contraction. So I think as long as you just see moderate, just reasonable, maybe what you might call, you know, 
uh, uh, just Goldilocks moderate kind of data where you continue to see weak inflation, decent uh, jobs market, decent action by the consumer, maybe some uncertainty built into uh, how corporations are spending and investing. I think that that just continues to milk this situation along. We get expectations low enough that it's easy for companies to beat. We keep the Fed on the easing side of the spectrum. Some of all this money that's piled into the bond market over the last six months is going to have to rebalance into the stock market. I just There's just no way we're not going to at some point see that dam break. And that, to me, suggests a, a, an acceleration to the upside more likely than resistance coming into play. I mean, if I see some signs that that's wrong, I'll be quick to switch in that bias. But the, 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 there's a prepotency here, I think, for a kind of uh, accelerating breakout to the upside just because of all the money that has been pulled out of this market and is sitting there uh, in a cautious kind of exposure profile. Wow, based on that, it sounds like we're about to have a uh, a six handle on the VIX, Brett. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I I, it, it, I suppose though, if people start to take uh, catastrophe hedges on the upside because they don't own any stocks, you can actually see situations where the VIX rises in a rising market. It's rare, but it's not impossible. All right, before we step away from your macro view on equities, I think Blue Chip had a question for you regarding some of the sentiment, so I'll allow him to ask that question. Sure. Yeah, I think you Fred, pretty much maybe answered it already in that commentary, but uh, I know recent that you've talked about this on your sentiment and flow show once a week with Gavin here the last couple of weeks, where... Um, outflows of money has actually shown uh, to be increasing and it's actually I think a recent stat said something about how is one of the uh, the higher levels of outflows in the market uh, over the last like 10 years so I was just curious to know like that's usually associated with bear market bottoms and it just seems like yeah. it's just something odd to see at this dynamic with the large cap indices making record highs um, now granted small caps and mid caps are a little underperforming um, they haven't cleared the year-to-date highs yet but it just seems like a very weird dynamic that you just some basically summarized uh, to say that there's a lot of money on the sidelines I think that there's still lots more upside potential in this market if if, uh, if it really wants to so, yeah. together institutional and retail pulled 141 billion dollars out of stocks so far this year and that's one of the higher readings we've seen in the last uh, almost yeah. Yeah, and, so, right? and, and another way to put it, and one of the way that uh, uh, one of the Bank of America reports put it was, this is the, I think the largest divergence between performance of equity and and credit markets relative to fund flows in equity and credit markets in, in history. So basically, the there's so much repositioning toward caution and so much outperformance relative to that caution that it's kind of the greatest divergence ever that we've seen in terms of how assets are acting versus how people are positioned. Which to me seems like I, I don't understand how that's not building toward an acceleration, but yeah, you know, yeah, we'll see. I I agree 100 percent, you know, and just uh, I mean, I, the one I always, you know, I'm a technical analyst, so I obviously just focus a lot, 90 percent of my stuff. I assume that everything is factored into price itself because that reflects where money is being put to work, and I mean, to put it in layman's terms, my charts look pretty. <laughs> they look really pretty these days. I have uh, the cumulative advanced decline line on the New York Stock Exchange. That's uh, my overall uh, breadth indicator for the market for bullish and bearish uh, secular cycles. That's been banging up against all all time new highs here throughout June um, and and here in July. And we've we've made some nice strides to recover the losses from May in the large cap indices and sector rotation is really you know the lifeblood of this market there are some really fantastic groups out there so uh, I can talk about that in a little bit more details unless uh, Jim wants to take this a different direction well as far as rotation goes one of the things that I do find somewhat concerning and something that blue chip has brought up before and that is the relative weakness in the small caps I'm assuming that it does have something to do with the dollar mm -hmm. but um, mm -hmm. it, are you worried about that yet Brett I mean what if we we continue to have this uh, this this policy the way it is and the mm -hmm. dollar just kind of declines slow drip down and then some of the more cyclical or I'm sorry some some of the more riskier stock stocks and uh, and 
and um, sectors may not participate in this, and that could be a key driver in a lot of it. Is, is it going to be led by all large caps, or where do you fall on uh, as, as to where the small caps stand? So I, I even, despite what I said, I do believe that this is very late cycle. I think that even if we were to see an acceleration to the upside, I, I, I guess I don't believe that it's the beginning of a five-year extension of the bull market. Um, I could see that being something that's significant and almost, you know, it, uh, mania-like for a, a shorter period of time, and we still end up with some, you know, some late cycle dynamics that eventually lead to the cycle rolling over before too much longer. Um, and I think that when you get to that point, last several cycles, the small caps have tended to underperform during the final phase of, of a major bull market run. And, you know, that makes sense. And it also makes sense that um, if we've shifted to convergence, we've, we've been in divergence where the U.S. monetary policy was diverging from the rest of the world by normalizing when no one else was. And now this move by the Fed is convergence. We're moving back into doing things in step with other major central banks. And that is kind of a, a – that certainly changes people's projections for where the dollar is headed. And I suppose if you're a large asset manager, generally speaking, um, small caps tend to outperform in a strong dollar environment and underperform in a weaker dollar environment. So maybe if people are already tentative and already feeling late cycle and then starting to project weaker uh, uh, forward action from the dollar, then, then it's even tougher to get fund flows to push into smaller cap, more domestic-oriented uh, companies. Um, and I think that makes sense for that whole paradigm. Now maybe we'll see them break out like crazy when we get a kind of FOMO dam-breaking period. Um, but, I mean, if you look back historically, small caps, generally speaking, don't lead in the final leg of a bull market and tend to reemerge maybe from, from the bear market a little bit quicker. So um, that, that all kind of still makes sense if you think of this as like a big jigsaw puzzle. All right. So as far as that late cycle goes, what inning do you think we're in? Uh, I don't know. Um, it, 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 if we are easing now and we've done our, we're, we're headed for our first cut and we break out again and we accelerate to the upside, it may be a situation where it's really, you know, still looking at possibly entering something that's more significant on the downside in 2020 would make sense to me. But, um, you know, I mean, we'll just have to see. It's, it, it would make sense as a bias to think that way. Um, but perhaps this has got, you know, perhaps this has been such a slow burning process that there is a, a more protracted final stage that can feel like extra innings. But I, I, I you know, I obviously I don't have a crystal ball. I'm saying whatever inning it is that equates to the uh, final inning being spring of 2021. You know why? Why is that? Because we will be past the election. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. I was just about to say the election is going to be huge. Go back to the charts on uh, in, to what happened in 2015 leading into 2016, and uh, <laughs> you can just see that the market was definitely uh, not sure what was going to happen with the new regime and wh or who was going to take over, which parties and what process processes uh, were going to be in place going well, forward. Let's, so let's not forget that was when the commodity space completely blew up. Okay. Right, I mean, 2000. Look at look at the crude oil chart. Like that yeah, was 2015. We had, yeah, we had bankruptcies across the entire commodity space. Right. So that was, I think, tempering what the S and P looks like. But certainly, there was a lot of uncertainty coming into and through Brexit and then into the election. Yeah, there was, there's always going to be something down the road here, and it it, it just seems like right now, though, uh, from my perspective on the charts, I just see a lot of uh, a lot of strength. Everything is looking pretty darn good. Um, now, obviously, uh, it will change if there's going to be a short-term uh, corrective movement of sorts here during the summer, which, uh, you know, it's not, that's not foreign in, in, according to history. But at the same time, we are seem to, there does seem to be that continuous climbing a wall of worry that seems to be going on in this market um, that has me also leaning quite bullish. So. All right. Since most of our guys are more equity focused i guess it's fair to say that brett why don't we talk about some other asset classes with you and sure. some of the uh, some of the themes that you're going to be seeing okay i mean you know i continue to be long gold i think that's yeah my, let's go to gold it, 
it's, I mean, it's acting terrific, the way that it's handling this consolidation. I was worried that there was the possibility that we'd have a one-and-done breakout out of that long-term uh, ascending triangle that we've been tracking. And right now what we're seeing is a lateral consolidation following that. And that would make sense given, you know, exactly what we're seeing from, from, uh, from Powell so far. In, in talking to Congress, like that, that he's not shooting that down in any way. There's obviously a lot of uh, a lot of demand, and it's 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 performing well inside of a consolidation of the initial breakout move, which would lead me to believe that we are going to see a further extension higher. And I would imagine it's pretty reasonable to start looking for a test of the 1500 level um, as that next target. And I've got I've got the GLD position that remains in place, and I may do. What I did uh, last month where there was a point when I added a full-size futures position as well for the what I call the order cascade of the breakout and then take profits on that and keep the GLD position in place, um, that would make sense to me probably as I see this this process of consolidation continue to play out. If it sets up just another nice breakout, then I'll, I'll probably do that. Um, and uh, as far as crude oil, I actually turned a little bit bearish on crude oil a couple of days ago, and then we've got, I didn't really do much in the way of, of trading it. I was waiting for the data. We got two really bullish data points, and I wanted to see if they'd sell that news. Um, and, you know, I, I took a, a, a really quick short and got out of it basically uh, no harm, no foul pretty quickly after I watched the orders coming through. There was just a lot of, a lot of bidding coming in. So, and I guess, you know, in a, in a scenario where people are projecting a weaker dollar, and we've got the Fed kind of giving us this signal of uh, opening the, the floodgates even with strengthening economic data. That makes sense. It's kind of tough to tough to sell that. And you've got some other catalysts, geopolitical catalysts as well. So I'm just kind of on hold as far as strategy on that and probably expecting a little more upside. I think it's bounced back to right about, if you look at the WTI continuous contract, we are back to about the 61.8% Fib retrace of the April to June decline. So right around this 60.50 to 60.75 area is Fib resistance, but we have broken through all the moving averages, which are flat and turning up. Um, so it's possible that this could just retake that entire entire decline, which would be awfully interesting. Um, and uh, as far as the dollar, we talked a bit about the dollar. The euro has been harboring a large short position, according to CFTC data. Um, it really, I suppose, given what the Fed is doing, I would think it would be a little bit stronger. But, you know, every step the Fed is taking, the ECB is taking it twofold as far as the way that they're they're arranging their language. So it really does look like kind of a race to the bottom at this point. So um, there's a there's more headwinds for Europe. That's that's plausible. So maybe we really see a lack of currency volatility for a bit, which suggests that you really want to be moving your capital around in, in other markets, commodities and uh, and, and, and equities. And then, you know, the other big one is obviously we are finally starting to see the the move the rally in bonds kind of roll over a bit as the Fed is taking this position. There's a little bit of steepening action coming back into the curve, and I think that that would make a lot of sense as well, um, given that this move by the Fed does represent something where the data has improved a little bit and the Fed is still committed to tampering down the short side of the curve. And it's important to remember the short side is controlled by the Fed, the long side is controlled by the market, so the market should react by popping up interest rates a little bit at the longer end, and it's probably a good sign that we're starting to see that, but I don't have a trading position there. If I took one, I might just do a steepener kind of position. All right. Anything else, any other questions for Brett from any of the team before I move over into uh, some questions with Gavin? Um, I got a question for Brett Node. I guess I'll kind of work into um, probably some of the things that I'll be discussing, but Brett, I laid out four questions um, that I thought were key for the market. The first one being how will earnings season progress. Second was uh, the trade front. The third one, of course, was the FOMO trade, which um, you pretty much touched upon those. We, we didn't really discuss trade too much here, but um, here's what I think is one of the more important questions. Um, do you think, I mean, the market's fully uh, pricing in it feels like, and I heard you use the term before, an easing cycle. Mm -hmm. What what do you think if July 31st 
in the next three weeks, I laid out some of the data points that we got. We got a pretty steady round of data the, and some forward-looking data with the Empire and Philly. Uh, I didn't see it on the calendar, but I'm pretty sure we get the first reading for Q2 GDP. What do you think if the Fed kind of, I don't want to necessarily say pivot, but uh, looks more like a one and done on the cut? So, I mean, I think that that would be, it would depend on what data caused that, I suppose. Um, it's all about, I think, the relationship between the data and how they react to it. I, I think that there is an undercurrent of not really not wanting to give in to uh, people acclimating to below target inflation. And I think that there is the desire to want to run it above target if possible, and that they're just so far away from that that I could see it being very easy to justify more than one rate cut. And right now, the Fed Fund's futures show that even after some of the strong data that we've seen. Um, and you look at, you know, you just claims in CPI this morning. You look at jobs data we got uh, last week. You, everything has kind of started to, to suggest that there really isn't an imminent economic problem, and yet there they're, he's really making very clear with Congress right now that there's they don't see any harm in continuing to cut rates. So I, I think that under those conditions, I don't see how that language is going to change at the end of July unless we saw some really positive shift in, in economic data that made it look just absurd to keep cutting. And then, you know, that would kind of temper the market's reaction to that at the same time. So I'm not sure that risk is there that badly, especially given positioning. But, I, you know, I mean, if the market starts to act funky in relationship to it, then I would shift. Yeah, and I, I tend to agree with you. And one of the interesting things I thought from the minutes was the addition when they went into other downside risks that they were citing. And we just, I just saw some headlines from Powell Crossing about this, too, is the fed, federal budget negotiations, which is something that could certainly mm -hmm. be weighing in on us late in the summer and heading into the fall, which I think keeps that September rate cut also on but it was just interesting like when you see Bullard saying there's not a case for a 50 basis point cut yet and stuff so uh, I, I think that is one threat to um, a market rally here in the later part of the summer but uh, you know I, I think before we really get into that the next three weeks is going to be dominated by the earnings scene myself so yeah but yeah that was my question for Brett then Jim all right, well, then why don't we just pick the ball right back up, Gavin, and what are some of the things that you are looking forward to? I know you're going to focus on earnings. What are some of the key sectors that might be of interest to you? Yeah, well, um, I don't know if you're able to pull up next week's earnings calendar on uh on the site here, but just to run through, uh, the the primary focus for me next week is the financials, and of course, uh, I always love, I, I've followed the financials for years here, and I always find it important because just that loan growth gives you such a good read on the corporate side of the economy there to see exactly what's going on, so that's going to be certainly one of the things that I'm looking at, obviously for the banks themselves, there's expectations for a little bit lower on the trading revenue. News, the, those net interest margins to start getting hit a little bit. We already saw Goldman with their Marcus product um, cut their lending rates in anticipation of a Fed rate cut a couple of weeks ago. But I uh, look for those net interest margins and net interest income to be a little bit weaker. Now, I don't think any of that really impacts the financials, but the overall read through loan growth and their comments on the economy writ large and their, how their customers are doing are gonna, is going to be key. I, don't think a cautious tone is necessarily going to set in line a lot of selling, but um, it will help raise the case for that 50 basis point cut for um, you know that additional 25 coming in September. The other area, and I was talking with Scott about this on the IYT, the transportation index, but in addition to financials, we're going to get J.B. Hunt's out next week, Canadian Pacific is out next week. Um, UAL is going to be reporting, uh, CSX has their uh, results, uh, uh, Kansas uh, KSU is going to be out later on in the week too, they're out on Friday, So and uh, UNP as well, so I think the transportation and the financials are 
really going to give us a great insight into how the um, economy is performing in terms of the corporates and where demand is. And one has to expect a cautious picture, kind of that kitchen sink outlook that Brett was talking about, perhaps maybe not that drastic, but uh, certainly going to give us a pulse on how the economy is doing on that side of things. Uh, in addition to that, there are a few notable tech names out. IBM is going to be out next week, Microsoft, um, who else is out? Netflix is another name that I know a lot of people are going to have their eyeballs on. So collectively between big tech, uh, the financials and um, financials too. You could also throw in American Express and Capital One just to get an eye on the um, on the consumer side of financials as well. Is going to be hitting reports, so that's going to give us a really pretty good insight on the corporate economy there. And I think collectively, it's going to be important to see how the market reacts to this. On top of that, a little bit of an early gift for us is going to be. Crowdsource and Chewy earnings, which is pretty rare to see these new IPOs reporting with all the big boys out here. So um, I'm really curious to see how they're going to react. So in terms of focus for the next, call it seven sessions, um, next week and a half, I think transportation, financials, and even uh, for more perhaps tradable aspect, and I'm sure Damon will be looking at his chops at watching this activity, it's going to be those two IPOs popping out in the middle of uh, the middle of the blue chippers. So it's going to be an interesting week, first week, to uh, get a good read at the economy, and perhaps more importantly, how are we going to see markets react to this? I've been talking a lot about those May end reports with Micron and FedEx, and how they had those kitchen sink type quarters. Um, now they both came in better than feared. I talked a little bit about how so far the early returns, uh, as Bank of America was talking about, was that the surprise to the upsides has been well outpacing what the averages are. And that's usually about an 83% correlation to this er to earnings for the full earnings season. So we do have a better than feared Get used to seeing that comment a lot with a lot of names, I feel, 1Q2 res results um, pass. Now, when that happens, and of course we're going to have PAL uh, on the horizon too with that July 31 rate cut coming, is that enough for people to gloss over some weaker results and to get in, in which case could we get perhaps that blow off top um, before uh, we see any sort of selling coming in? around earnings. So I do think that markets are going to see a little bit of that sideways action that uh, Scott and Brett were talking about, but I do think that that could also lead to more of a coiling to the upside. Uh, one caveat outside of this, of course, is the trade negotiations and how much that weighs in on sentiment. But, um, you know, we, we saw the Trump tweet before, and, you know, that caused us to knock in eight points on the S&P before we saw that really reverse. So I don't think that that's going to be as big of an issue for everybody else's as long as uh, these earnings reports are coming in relatively uh, solid and companies are able to, like we saw Fastenal today, talking about where they were able to pass on a lot of their costs to the consumer so far, if we see a lot of commentary from that, that might ease the concern around some of this tariff picture here. And then there's the debt ceiling, but for the debt ceiling, I think we got to get to the 11th hour before that really becomes an issue for people. And um, if, in that case, we're looking at the September time frame for that. Also, of course, during September, it's a chance for another basis, a 25 basis point cut, maybe even a 50 basis point cut if things are deteriorating that quickly. So uh, these are some of the things that I'll be looking at. But I think next week's earnings and the read off of them from, a, from uh, how investors react are going to be pretty key for the markets. Let me toss something at you, Gavin. So when when is the official transition for the uh, the head of the ECB? October. October, okay. And I'm not exactly sure, but recent memory seems to seems to indicate that when there is a transition, the powers that be or the market itself tends to test that new 
Fed leader or uh, the new uh, central bank leaders resolve. We saw it with um, Bernanke and Janet Yellen and to some extent Powell. And we definitely saw Mario Draghi take his hit and then he stood up and said, we'll do whatever it takes. What are the risks in Europe that could be looming, that could that the market could toss at Christine Lagarde? What are some of those risks? Because you know they're out there, and we haven't really talked a lot about them, but you've got to figure that there will be some kind of quote-unquote test in store. Well, I mean, right off the bat, you look at Brexit, that's going to be uh, rolling right down around the same time Ms. Yell- uh, Ms. Lagarde's coming into um, power there, so... Uh, you know, that's certainly going to be something that will be an early test for her, especially if um, Boris Johnson's there. That could certainly turn into a pretty combative situation. As far as policy goes, I think Draghi pretty much tied her hands, so I don't really see her being able to change the dial too much on policy. So I don't, I don't think that that's necessarily going to be as much of an issue for the ECB. It's going to be about that Brexit process and how that impacts it. And then, of course, the other backdrop is going to be that's when we're going to start getting the Italian um, budget and the Greek budget under the new regime, which has promised aggressive uh, corporate tax rate cuts. And, uh, you know, that's going to be some of the first initial actions that she's going to have to come in and take place. Now, I think the question is going to be how much does Draghi address the, um, these three issues, the Brexit, Italy, Italian budget, and Greek budget, before she gets into office? Does he try to kind of jump on that grenade for her and, uh, and hit a pretty aggressive tone? We certainly saw from the ECB minutes this morning that they are uh, full on boat with perhaps further easing, further rate cuts, bringing QE back, and easier terms for the TLTROs. So uh, Madame Lagarde could certainly come in with a full boat easing on the ECB going on and therefore really not have much to do certainly there's the chance for a misstep we see that pretty much every time like you're pointing out with Bernanke Yellen Powell where it takes them a little while to get the parlance correct and get in the cadence of markets without rattling markets under the idea of a new new uh, head of a central bank so I think that's going to be her top priorities and her top um, hurdles when she comes in to office in October all right. Any other markets that you're going to be focusing on? I know you like to look at the euro uh, to some extent. Anything that you're finding opportunistic in the, in the euro at all? It's kind of just riding a, um, along. If you look at it on the monthly, this 50 average here, uh, take a quick peek at the weekly. It's pretty much right around that 50 uh, weekly moving average, too. And then same thing for the daily. So I just kind of see it riding that uh, – Perhaps until we get a little bit more clarity, as I was just talking with Brett about whether or not the Fed's in an easing cycle, or if this is just a one-and-done insurance rate cut for the markets, uh, that's certainly going to play out. Um, Economic data from France has helped, but uh, I kind of think that the euro, if it wasn't for the political issues, would be eyeing a run-up to that 114 level and for a potential breakout, but Due to the uh, po- potential for policy errors on, um, or uh, political issues, I, I just think that the euro is trapped in this 111 to 114 area for the foreseeable future until we can get a little bit more clarity, and uh, that also includes that Brexit issue. All right. I'm going to move over to blue chip trader Scott. So. I know you're going to be really scouring the the charts for opportunistic trades and earnings season, but you always have good calls on some of the sectors that are that you think might have some better than expected results. Do you have any type of bias leading into this earnings season? Uh, you know, it's <laughs> it's just basic trend following and sector rotation for the most part. I try not to uh, look a little deeper than that. Like I said earlier, I, I, I am a firm believer that price action on the charts 
uh, is, is where people put their money. Uh, they're putting their money where their mouth is. And uh, if the trend is higher and they're outperforming, I believe that institutions and big funds are going to uh, support those stronger performing names. And if they're um, underperforming, they're, they're going to be quicker to uh, cut it loose or to pound it lower um, because of that overall sentiment and theme that's going on there. Uh, but relatively speaking, you know, uh, just take a look at some of the relative performance over the last six months or so, year to date, and we do have some really strong uh, performances in certain subsectors. Uh, specifically, you know, if, if we start off with uh, healthcare, the medical device and equipment stocks, uh, those have just been on fire year to date. I look at the IHI as a leading. Um, ETF for that sector, and that's your Abbott Labs, it's your Medtronics, your Danaher's, your uh, Becton Dickinson. Uh, it's got just fantastic names, and you can just see that the IHI is just uh, really just holding up better than a lot of different market sectors. So I would suspect that um, you know that 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 trend continues going forward for that for their earnings results. Um, restaurants, from a discretionary side, McDonald's, Starbucks, uh, Dunkin' Donuts. Yum Brands, uh, they just all look really, really good, uh, trending higher, outperforming the markets lately uh, in the discretionary area. So I suspect that to continue. Yeah, what's up? I would just add on to that consumer side, every comment from Fed members in the minutes continue to suggest consumer spending habits just remain really strong. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, when did consumer, the consumer, we love to spend our money, There's especially, you know, everywhere. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, 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 that's a great sign of just the money flowing back into the economy and stuff like that from a technical perspective. Uh, you know, another area too that we don't talk about too much too is the uh, the hotel leisure section sectors. Um, they're not the fastest and most sexiest names out there to be trading, but if you ever take a look at a chart of like Hilton Hotels uh, or Hilton Worldwide, it is these days HLT, uh, Marriott, M A R. These things have just been appearing on the all-time new high list, uh, you know, week after week, month after month, doing the really good price structure there. So, it's, again, another sign of uh, consumer spending uh, willing to go, uh, you know, at these hotels and whatnot, in addition to eating out at restaurants and uh, whatnot. So that's another good space, too, I suspect that uh, we'll do okay. Financials are right on the cusp here. They've recently started to improve after a pretty dismal, uh, let's go with nine months, you know, just of kind of choppy action, just going with the flow on a day-to-day -day basis. But recently with that car report, they have started to perk up a little bit. Uh, they're on that tipping point where I think if they have a good earning season, we could start to see some further uh, acceleration to the upside there. And then finally, software. This is probably the... Um, you know the, uh, the the most difficult one to do because uh, the the group is so strong. It's ridiculously strong. How uh, the year to date, everyone loves these software security type of plays that are out there. Um, it's just the it's one of the hottest sectors, and they're movers, they're leaders, uh, their growth stories are all there. Um, but from a valuation perspective, we've continuously heard that they're uh, beyond you know uh, the point where they're going to be able to uh, maintain this type of continued growth on a valuation perspective. And there, everyone's waiting for that one day where they uh, a day of reckoning to come, where they're going to start getting these aggressive like gap downs and reversals. Maybe that's this earnings season. I don't know, but uh, this is going to be a group that I think is going to be super hot in coming weeks, where there's going to be a lot of good trading uh, trading opportunities. I feel like the short interest in these names are very high from a uh, fundamental perspective and just the slightest surprise or continuation signs of growth can really just continue to see these stocks accelerate to the upside. Um, that's really it. I think the other group too, if I throw one out there, uh, all right, let's throw two out there. Uh, <laughs> we have the uh, credit card companies. They've been doing really well. Visa, MasterCard, American Express. Uh, they're just banging on all cyl cylinders here these days. Strong trends higher, so they, I would suspect they have good uh, uh, earnings results as well. Uh, and then even some of these exchanges. Let's go with that. The exchanges. Uh, the CME, the ICE, the NASDAQ, NDAQ, uh, CBOE, 
they've been secretly kind of grinding their way higher amongst the financials. And I think they are also looking like uh, some expectations are going to be pretty good out of those groups. So generally speaking, I'm watching, you know, that was that chunk of five or six sectors. There's a few more out there, but I don't want to take up too much time. I'll, I'll be talking about them on the site as they come around. So in anticipation of this, Will you be looking for or focusing more in on some of these names and more paying more attention to when their earnings are going to come out and look for more opportunistic trades in those sectors in particular or not so much? Uh, so from a shorter term trading perspective, yes. like the swing trader, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I do typically look ahead about a week or so a week or two at our earnings calendar and if anybody doesn't know how to do that you just uh, go to calendars and it's the first choice uh, that says earnings results and obviously you get to get the results for the current day but if you look at the uh, sub uh, headings that are down to the right there you can actually go out a week in advance uh, or a couple weeks in advance actually and look to see what earnings are going to be reported so that's one way of looking at it and I just take a quick scroll through there and typically, you get what I call the pre-earnings pop, where anywhere between two to, say, five days before an earnings report, some t it's not uncommon to see bids start getting into, the, into a, a name and try to lift it ahead of time. Uh, for whatever reason. Uh, occasionally you get a sell-off, but again, just if the market's not doing anything, you tend to just see support in these names develop, and they tend to edge a little bit higher into their reports uh, from a generally speaking basis. So that could definitely be one way to play them, especially in these stronger names that have been outperforming that you know everyone's going to be watching. Um, the other way to play it, it would be a I don't. I, I rarely hold stocks into earnings on a shorter term basis. Uh, Investing is a whole different story, but uh, from the short term trading perspective, I would trade them up into the day of earnings, and then I'd get out, uh, assuming I didn't have that much of a cushion to deal with. Usually, I like to have at least a 10% profit uh, to hold into earnings. Um, but then post earnings, that's always pretty significant. Uh, you want to see. And it's open to interpretation, but it's you want to see how disruptive of a gap takes hold, if there is one at all, and how does this uh, this gap play into fact and play play its role based upon where the stock has been trading since the last quarter? Are there trapped longs in a stock that tra that gaps down ten percent? Are there trapped shorts in a stock that gaps up more than ten percent? And you can usually get a good gauge of whether that gap is going to reverse or not, uh, depending on how large the gap is and where the last, say, three to, three, three to six months of activity has been. And you can usually get a good day trade out of it if you can uh, read that type of scenario uh, very well. I did a whole webinar on this a couple of years back, and I've been talking about it the last couple earnings seasons uh, on Trader Audio here. So, uh, And I've been walking everyone through that uh, in more details as it comes about. So we'll see if there's a few day trades setting up there. And then... Uh, as always, you know, when everybody moves on to the uh, the next earnings report, you always want to keep track of the ones that gap significantly and keep track of them for a few days after the dust has settled and everyone's forgotten about it because that's typically when the best swing trades set up where you can take a position based upon a gap support or gap resistance level and ride that for a couple of weeks usually at a time uh, for some pretty significant moves. So there's a lot going on in earnings season. This is why I said, you know, keep things relatively light this week between the uh, uh, 4th of July holiday last week and the upcoming earnings season because there's going to be, you know, you want to save, you don't want to make any stupid mistakes during this early two-week time frame in July when there's going to be tons of opportunities to make money uh, the next couple of weeks during earnings season. All right, hitting cleanup is Scalp Trader. And Scalp, I know that a lot of your focus will end up being some of the stocks that will gap due to these earnings, uh, some of what Blue Chip just laid out. And I know it's going to be particular on, on whatever given day that may be, but you also focus in on some of the other, um, how how can you call it, D different, different uh 
asset classes within equity, such as yield. And I'm curious if you're finding anything in, in the yield portfolio that is getting enticing based on the fact that bonds and, uh, you know, 10-year yields have come down considerably since oh, the, the beginning of the year, let's call it. And is there something that you're getting interested in in that space? And then we can talk a little more about some of the specific things that you're looking at equity-wise. Okay, yeah, sounds good. Can you hear me okay? I can. All right, so, uh, yeah, and it's, it's interesting. It seems like the market has waited for the Fed to, you know, basically lay out its hand before stepping into the yield space and starting to bid up some of these names. Um, I've been pretty bullish on yields since, uh, I don't know, since January or February when it was first indicated that the Fed may start to have to uh, start pulling back on uh, rate hikes. Um, there are a few names that I really like, uh, NG, and all of them are already in the portfolio. Uh, NGL, Preferred C, which I mentioned, I think, last time we talked, trading at twenty-five, twenty-seven right now, $25 par, uh, 9 and 7 eighths coupon. Um, the underlying NGL uh, partners, it just broke out to 52-week highs yesterday. And this is a research name. This is a name that had problems in the past, uh, they've really gotten their act together, and the market is just not recognizing the quality here. I mean, this is a name that should probably trade at under an 8% yield, uh, which would suggest capital appreciation of 10 to 15% from here. Uh, I'm really bullish on the mortgage REITs. Uh, this is a very positive environment for a mortgage REIT. Uh, they've gotten hit because um, the financing costs for their books have has stayed at an elevated le level, but uh, the yield curve has uh, it has become uh, gotten in a better situation for them in terms of steepening. And so I think that the mortgage REITs could really actually outperform here. MRRL, which is the uh, UBS E-Trax uh, monthly two-time levered RT ETN is starting to bounce off recent lows. We bought it back in December or January. Uh, we bought MORL, which is the which is really the same thing. Uh, that's up about 20% since we purchased it. And we've probably picked up about 10% in coupon payments at that, that, since then. I think the yield at that time was about 25%. Uh, current yield is about 20, around 20 to 22%. Still bullish on that and would be a buyer. Um, and another interesting one is uh, the Edison uh, International Power Company in California. Uh, looks like California is becoming uh, friendlier towards creating some type of scenario that allows, uh, you know, that changes the law, that no longer puts uh, the power companies on the hook for all of these fire damages. And so that's really been helping Pacific Gas and Electric, which is in bankruptcy but still trading at 20 four dollars a share even though that they've already filed for bankruptcy Edison is in the portfolio I think we bought it at 60 trading at 70 right now decent yield uh, I would be looking for pullback entries on a name like that uh, DCP midstream 10 percent yield we owned it in the portfolio already at about the current price um, you know again I think energy companies have really gotten their balance sheets in order over the past couple of years and market's not giving them credit for it. Uh, so there's an opportunity to pick up a company at a 10% yield that's actually growing their distributions. Um, so, I mean, this could be uh, trading at 31 now. And I think especially as natural gas starts to bounce and uh, crude oil crude oil stabilizes here, and this could be a $40 stock uh, not in, you know, not too long from now. Uh, so, yeah, that's my kind of initial list of uh, attractive names. I have some tech names that are on the on the radar, like Stitch Fix after their strong earnings report last quarter, uh, doing a little bit more on the short-term short -term options side, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's what I'm up to these days. All right. We did have one question come in that wants to get your commentary on why, why this is one that you day trade quite a bit um, when you're involved in um, your, you know, the early part of the, the, the session. So do you have any new commentary on why, why here? Uh, not really. I mean, I'm just kind of sitting back, uh, slowly accumulating it. I mean, I think the value, it's a, it's a really attractive valuation. Uh, most of their business actually is uh, outside of China. 
I don't think it, but it still trades with the Chinese name. So situation where, you know, sometimes you're just, you know, the market doesn't recognize its obvious things. And, you know, and so that's one of those things. Why, why still trades with China when it really shouldn't? Um, I think 75% of their revenue or something like that is derived outside of China. Uh, so I think once, uh, you know, market starts to recognize the, both the combination of the value, I mean, they're sitting on a ton of cash. Uh, they have a large stake in Huya, which is rapidly growing, and they're growing their business uh, pretty strongly outside of China. So just kind of sitting back. I mean, this is one that I think over time, I mean, conservatively, I think this could double. Um, but, you know, I mean, market's taking its time uh, moving in, in that direction. And, you know, we have a stop, I think, maybe three points below here. If it gets hit, I'll honor it just because of the really negative uh, price action, um, especially going into the earnings report. Uh, but it's one that I, I really like long term. And unless I'm totally misreading this, I think this is just massively undervalued. And uh, but again, I'm not going to, you know, may, you know, again, may, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's something that I'm not seeing or the market doesn't value it the same way. So that's why we have stops in place. All right. Are there any other themes that maybe we didn't touch on that anyone wants to bring up that's something that we need to get out in front of before we check out for this session? No, I, I, not on my end. I think we covered everything that we should be looking at. Well, I have a question. It seems like everyone is you know, pretty unanimously, unanimously bullish. And uh, just some of the names that you know people are looking at in terms of uh, you know, names you want to stash into the portfolio and, and hold and to, to ride this market higher. Was that for me, D, or is that well, for... just Yeah, just anyone. I mean, I think, yeah, probably, uh, Gavin, you always have some names on your radar. Yeah, I mean, I think if we're going to go higher, uh, I, I mean, a lot of the names that I'm riding in my portfolio have been pretty, um, pretty uh, well in touch or, um, had had a pretty heavy hand in the markets already with equities. Names that I'd be looking at, I would the, the IYT. I think would be an area where I'd be watching for a rebound in, and, and um, you, you know I think there's some value there. So uh, FedEx is a name that I'm currently involved with right now. That'd be one that I'd have on the radar to move its way back up. Um, a couple of financials for a breakout potentially to Bank of America is one that I'd have on the radar. I already own that one, so could look to add to that. Uh, certainly keeping an eye out on how these IPOs are uh, trading at the moment, but um, there are a few of the names that I'd be looking at in terms of spaces. Um, you know, I got involved with UNH. I'm mostly out of it now, but I could uh, be enticed to get back a little bit further in on that if uh, we see a favorable ruling on the ACA out of Texas and that's going to lead up to a big battle in um, in uh, 2020 but the results around earnings were pretty good last quarter so I think uh, that that health insurance area that's been long beaten up because of fears of this Medicare for all that I don't think was really ever rationally going to be coming into play would be in another area where I'd take a look at so uh, a couple of these semi names, I think they could still get going because uh, you know it's a cyclical space there. And if people think that the bottom's in, with some of the commentary that we've seen from Micron, that we could be looking at bigger runs in in the Microns of the world and Nvidia. So there are a couple of areas that are definitely on my radar for taking a look at. Uh, and uh, also just add on with the financials, their valuations are still pretty attractive down here. So there there are a few things, and uh, you know I really like Brett's Gold Long too. Uh, the GLD here because if we are going to be going higher a lot of that's going to have to do with central bank easing around the world so you could certainly see a continued uh, action in that and of course I also have the GBTC in uh, the Bitcoin space a small piece left on that that I could potentially add to so that would be, be some of the early uh, ones that I'm looking at what I'm going to be getting a little bit more in tune with too is some of is, as earnings come out I've got a nice collection of earnings names that I'm going to be keeping an eye on that I've been providing commentary on in my day ahead comment uh, just for follow-ups to track, to try, kind of track any sort of trends that are going into place here. The tough thing I would say is 
the spaces that are doing the fundamentally the best, like Scott was pointing out with the consumers, they've already run a lot. So it's going to be a matter of are you willing to kind of chase these or do you think that there's a turnaround in play to get some of these bottom feeders? And I, I think that's going to be the question that we're going to have to answer during our earnings season. But I'll be, um, as we go through and earnings reports come out, providing a lot more ideas out there in terms of exactly what I'll be looking at and names that I'm going to shoot at. Okay, sounds good. I want to throw out a couple of names I'm looking at um, on the short-term options side. Uh, Snap has had a really big run. I think they're reporting in about a week or so. Uh, it's a name I'll be looking to see if I can possibly play a gap up reversal or just an overall reversal, uh, just given the high expectations uh, going into the report. I think it was upgraded today or yesterday. Been a lot of bullishness on Snap after it kind of been thrown overboard just a few months ago. Uh, so I think that uh, that's one that, you know, one of, one of the ways I'm going to try to implement this uh, this trade is, you know, see if I can, if it gaps up in the morning and try to catch some weekly options that get hit that day for a price reversal. Same thing for CrowdSource, which reports next Thursday afternoon, I think. All right, so, yeah. oh, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, I was just going to say for me, you know, from a uh, uh, swing trading and day trading perspective, uh, my, my, my focus list has always been the liquid momentum focus list. So uh, those, those are typically the leading outperforming names that um, have lots of liquidity, decent amount of volatility, and they just provide nice uh, opportunities day in and day out, week in and week out. Uh, in, and if you're looking for a little bit more of a longer term swing trade, uh, you know, looking to hold something for a little bit, f uh, f uh, like a weekly time frame of sorts, maybe even a monthly time frame, you can't ignore the emerging growth focus list. Um, that is just fantastic uh, up and coming stocks with fantastic earnings growth, top and bottom line growth, as well as uh, performance and trends uh, in those names. So those are always worthwhile um, focusing on uh, those two focus lists there. So. All right, gentlemen, I think that should wrap things up for us in this segment. I can't thank you guys enough for the ideas and the themes that you guys provided, and we will be back again next week. So if there are any questions, feel free to hit us up on the Talk to Us button, and we can respond to those. Don't forget to leave your email. That helps out with the response, just in case you're not listening to the answers and uh, we definitely appreciate any feedback that you guys may have or questions love getting them love answering thank you guys so much Thanks. Thanks. Adios. Adios.